Merry Christmas. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for our Christmas Eve worship here at St. John's Evangelical Lutheran Church. We gather today recognizing and celebrating the greatest gift ever given, that of our Savior, and what it means for us. It means that hope has arrived. We follow the order of service as printed in your bulletins. We begin singing three verses of O Come All Ye Faithful. Please stand. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. At the heart of Christmas is rejoicing that God loved us enough to send Jesus to this world to be our Savior. Out of love for sinful humanity, Jesus willingly lived, died, and rose to life so we can have hope and live lives of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. We have sinned against him, therefore let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away your God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you made this holy night shine with the brightness of the true light. Grant that as we have known on earth the wonder of that light, we may also behold him in all glory in the life to come. Through your only Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. We continue singing two verses of O Little Town of Bethlehem.
We continue with the first of our scripture lessons in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. The, the greatest gift is described, and we hear a little bit about, about what Jesus would be like when he would come as true God. He would come being our wonderful counselor, mighty God, prince of peace. We read in Isaiah 9. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light, and those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the days of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is the word of the Lord. We continue with the next hymn. Luke chapter 2, we read verses 1 through 7, familiar words. We hear how the greatest gift arrives. We hear how God worked everything out to bring that young couple, Joseph and Mary, to the, to the appointed town so that the baby could be born in the humility that he was. We read, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the end. This too is the word of the Lord. Well, I continue with the children's devotion. And kids, I have here a pretty big label, right? Maybe you'll be seeing these. Your Christmas presents might have a label on them. Maybe not quite as big as this one. So, kids here, how many of you guys are going to open presents today yet? Me? Yep. We got a few. How many of you have to wait until tomorrow to open presents? Not as many. Most tonight. Okay, well, you're going to open those presents, and like I said, you're going to have some kind of a label on it. It'll be simply to, to you, your name will be there, from, 
maybe mom, maybe dad, grandpa, grandma, Aunt Susie, or something like that, you'll know who that gift is from. There is a Bible lesson that Pastor Cranky is going to read in a moment. Okay, we're going to sing a hymn after this, and Pastor Cranky is going to read another lesson. And there's an announcement that's going to be made in the lesson. It goes something like this. It says, today, it's the angels. They're talking to shepherds. And they say, today in the town of David, a Savior is born. He is Christ the Lord. Hold on. You know, I think I actually messed that up. I think it goes, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. So the angel, God had the angel include those important words to you for a reason. Because God wants you to know, he wants anybody who ever hears those words to know that that baby born in Bethlehem as God's gift to us, that it's for you. So it kind of looks like this, your label, to you from God. And you can think that no matter what you open and unwrap today, the greatest present you've ever been given is the present of a Savior, the present of Jesus, the present of knowing that your sins are forgiven, the present of knowing that Jesus is with you every day, the present of knowing that you get to be with him one day in heaven. Greatest gift ever, you and I have it. It's Jesus, to or from God, and that is to you. Let's say a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you loved us so much that you give us such a precious gift that we know that we can have Jesus as our Savior, that we have that present with us every single day. We pray this in your name. Amen. The story continues in Luke chapter 2 as the greatest gift is celebrated. And we, we hear so many of the characters of the Christmas story here. We have the angels and their glorious message reminding us we too should praise our God as we're doing right now. We have the shepherds who were first honored to hear that message and who shared it, which we should do as well. And, and we have Mary who pondered all these things in her heart. I have a little tradition that on Christmas Eve, we open presents on Christmas Eve. I'm a little excited. After all, the hoopla is over, though. A quiet moment to read Luke 2 again just for the hundredth time and ponder God's goodness. May we all do so tonight. We read, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. 
The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. This, too, is the gospel of our Lord. We continue with the next hymn. On the name of Jesus, the Christ, the Lord, the Savior born to you. I was watching an interview done with Jim Harbaugh. Some of you know him, some of you don't. He used to be quarterback. He played in the highest college level. He played in the NFL. He's also coached in the highest levels. He's coached in Division I football. He's coached professionally. I guess even for those of you who don't know him at all, hopefully you'll appreciate what I'm going to tell you about this interview. In the interview, he's, he joked about how they, they must have come some, from, from, some, from some fairly humble beginnings because he joked about how the, the house that he grew up in, it was probably about the smallest thing that you could live in that would be considered a house still. Yet his father instilled in them some pretty good values. There's this, this kind of like a mantra, a dialogue that they had. Where his dad, he would say to the kids, who's got it better than us? And the kids would say back, or we're supposed to always say back, nobody. That was just kind of a way that they did life. When things were going good, dad is, who's got it better than us? The kids, nobody. When things were going bad for them, when there were tough times, when they were sad after a sports loss or something like that, hey, who's got it better than us? Nobody. Think about that for a moment from your perspective as a Christian. That as a, as a Christian, not just the Christians here, as anyone in the world that's a Christian, who has it better than us? Nobody. No one has it better than you and I do as Christians. We wonder about that though, huh? Some Christians have kind of fairly high levels of stress or deal with depression or deal with different varying levels of anxiety just in life. Even sometimes where you, you, you're just anxious and you don't even know why you're anxious because you can't really pinpoint any reasons to that. Maybe it doesn't feel like nobody has it better than you at that point. Here we are on Christmas Eve and wearing masks. Those masks, a visible reminder that we live in a world where there is pain and there's sickness and there's disease and there's pestilence and all kinds of other things. Who's got it better than us? 
Maybe you're dealing right now where you have health issues and you can't do the things that you want to do with your grandchildren. You can't be there for them to help out and maybe even just being and going places and doing things with your wife and others like you'd like to because these are just plaguing and nagging things. It might not really feel like, yeah, who's got it better than me? Maybe you're thinking a lot of people. This time of the year is always tough too if you've lost someone close to you. It's kind of hard to say, who's got it better than me? When you've had to think of somebody that you buried, that you loved, that you're not going to be able to see again. You consider things that, just in the world, that, that people do to each other. Over the last two weeks, I had the opportunity to speak with uh, two gentlemen um, in their 90s. They fought in World War II, and they, they saw some pretty heavy action. And just some of the things they, they recounted and stories they retold to me, things that still just haunt them, even all these years later, in their mid-90s things that still haunt them in their dreams. There's all those things kind of on, on the outside. And then there's, we haven't even touched on the, the wickedness and the brokenness that lives inside of us. And how we just daily and routinely fail Jesus. We let him down in terms of the life of Christ, or the Christian life that, that he wants us to live. Seemingly, at times, unable to love our neighbors, even those who are closest to us. Sometimes the very, very people that we're married to are in our family. We don't forgive the way that God wants us to forgive. We can so easily put it where ourselves are at the center of the universe. So you kind of think, who's got it better than us? Maybe a lot of people. That's not the case, though, is it? That is something that is, that is true. Who's got it better? No one has it better than you and I as Christians. That will always be true. And why? Because by the grace of God, you understand and know the greatest gift. You know that you have hope. And it is not a hope that's kind of just like this vague idea that's just swimming around in this sea of uncertainty. Your hope is a person. Your hope has a face and a name. His name is Jesus. He is your hope, the one who is the God-man who came into this world and that saves sinners. On this first Christmas, or as we think about this first Christmas, you and I know that our hope has arrived. But maybe as we think about and try to ponder these, these, these great things, maybe we can sometimes think in terms of like, well, yeah, hope arrived. So Jesus came and he did his work and he left. But that's not the case, though, is it? Jesus is still here. We know and we understand, yes, Jesus ascended into heaven and so he's no longer among us in the sense that you and I, where we can see one another and he's interacting with us. But make no mistake about it. Your Savior, Jesus, he is still here. Your hope is still here. Your Savior is here, he's just as here with you in his word as you and I are here with one another right now. Your Savior is as present in your day-to-day -day life as the air that you breathe and the heart that beats inside of you. Your Savior is your hope and your Savior is always here. What does it mean? What does it mean to live the Christian life knowing that your Savior, Jesus Christ, knowing that you have that hope of Jesus and what he's done for you. So, in Paul's letter to the Romans, which we're going to look at now, in his letter to the Romans in chapter 8, he states these awesome things that God has done that are just realities. That Jesus dies on the cross to pay for the sins of all people and wins justification, wins forgiveness for all, and makes it so that believers are, are glorified. And he comes to that high point in Romans 8, verse 30. And then he makes an application to your life, to the life of every single Christian. In Romans 8, 31, verse 32, he says this, What then shall we say in response to this? So this good and awesome news that we have a Savior, Jesus. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, Graciously give us all things. What's Paul's point in saying that 
no one can be against us. I, I don't think he can't be saying that no one's ever going to be against us, right? Because your own experiences in life would say, well, that's not true because plenty of times I have things, I have forces, I have people that are against me. Even Jesus himself in John chapter 16 says, in this world you will have trouble. So there, there will be things that are against us. There are people that are against us. There's cancer, there's debt, there's financial problems, there's family problems, there's an angel, a legion of, of demons sometimes. There's death. But, so those things can be against us. But what, what Paul's point is that yes, you will have things against you, but God is always going to be mightier than any of those things. It doesn't matter what it is or who it is or how long it goes on for. That with God for you, he will always be mightier than any of those things. In fact, Paul wants you to know how just awesome that truth is and, and how grand that is because in the end of Romans 8, he sums things up by saying this, Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You hear those words, who, who has it any better than us? Nobody. No one can stand against you. Nothing can stand against you as a Christian because God is for you. Paul wants you to know, though, how? How can I be certain? How can I know for sure that God is going to be for Why would he be for me? He goes on with that phrase, God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. In the Old Testament, God tested Abraham and Abraham's love for God by asking Abraham to make the ultimate sacrifice, to sacrifice the only son that he had, the son promised to him and his wife Sarah. And as Abraham had that knife in his hand and as he was about to slay his son Isaac, the angel of the Lord came to him and said, Stop! Don't do it! It's just a test. It's a test of your love to see if you'll put God first and foremost before anything. And so he put that knife down and his son was spared. What God was asking Abraham to do on that day as a test, your loving Heavenly Father was willing to do in reality. That he so loved this fallen world that he gave his one and only son to be your sacrifice on the cross. And that your Savior, Jesus, loved you so much that he willingly took up that role as sacrifice because he loved you. Because he was not ashamed to call you and I brothers and sisters to die in our place so that you and I may have life. Who's got it any better than us? Nobody. We have Jesus. We have one who died and won forgiveness for us and who promises us heaven. There's even more that Paul wants you to know. Because he says, how will God, who's already given you Jesus, how will he not also, right along with Jesus, or in addition to Jesus, graciously give you all things? You've got to be careful with that one, though, right? Because the pessimist might hear that and say, well, I hope God gives me a bigger house because I'm going to need a lot of space for everything. So we're not the ones, though, that get to define what God means when he says he's going to give you all things. Paul's point in that is that God will make sure that with Jesus, God will make sure that you, ha you, that you have the sum total of everything that you need, everything that he wants you to have in your life. So I think about that, kids. I asked you guys already when you're opening Christmas presents and how many of you are kind of wondering, all right, when's church going to be done so we can get home and open those presents up? Maybe some of the adults are even wondering that a little bit too. It's in the back of the mind. All of our stuff, the presence, just all of the stuff that we have. 
God graciously along with Jesus, he gives us all things. He makes sure you have what, what you need and then the things that we want too. Maybe something to do with yourselves, adults, and even help with your kids out as you're opening presents tonight, either before or after, saying a prayer, Dear Jesus, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the things that you've given me, the things that you just allow us to have. And that's just the physical. And beyond the physical, you have all these awesome other blessings in the spiritual realm and also the physical realm. I don't want to end by just thinking about some of the thoughts in, from that lesson from Isaiah where God gives you a wonderful counselor. So as, you're, as our minds kind of try to process life in this world and process all the, just all the different thoughts about, their, about death and, you know, is there a this or is there a that? How should I live my life? What should I do? What's my guiding principles as a husband or as a wife? You, you have Jesus in his word as this wonderful counselor who just lays forth his principles and lays forth as kind of a constant for us to be able to make decisions and guide our lives by this wonderful counselor. And then when your heart and your conscience are plaguing you and bothering you because you can't get over some sin, something's plaguing you from even years and years ago, you can't get over the thought that, and the devil does this to us, he tries to, to convict us, God doesn't love you, you don't deserve God's love, you're not good enough. When, when all those thoughts come, this wonderful counselor, he's also the prince of peace. He's the prince of peace who comes to you to assure you that you do have peace with God. You have peace with God because of what I did for you. And it's all yours through faith in him. And as you and I live in the, just the chaos of this world, knowing that it's kind of a frightening thing sometimes when you really take a step back and realize that you and I, we don't have as much control as we'd want to have over our lives. We just really don't. And as we live in the, the, the chaos of that, it's so comforting to know that we have someone who's controlling all things, that all, all the, the governments of the world, that everything, the governments are on his shoulder, that, that he holds and he carries and he guides and he rules everything that we're going through, all of life, all the universe right now. And he's doing it all for you and me, for believers, for his church. He's doing it all so that we can have hope. He's doing it all so that more and more people who don't know that hope will be called to the faith and know that hope of Jesus. Because that's ultimately, isn't it, what life, what this is all about? It's about knowing Jesus, the greatest gift. It's about knowing that the hope that we have in him who, who has arrived and who is here with us every day. You think, of who's got it better than us? Nobody. No one has it better than you and I as Christians. We have Jesus and we have hope. Amen.
Please stand for the responsive prayer of the church as well as the Lord's Prayer. Uh, we do have some special prayer requests today. First, on behalf of Shane Becker, that's the nephew of our members, Don and Bo uh, Bonnie Wagey, as he is uh, under treatment for a, an acute form of leukemia. We keep him in our prayers. And then also, uh, Elsie Steinbach, that's the daughter of Alexa and Tim Steinbach, a granddaughter of our members, Ron and Heidi Wagner. We've been praying for this little girl the last couple of weeks. Uh, she was recently born with some anticipated health concerns, uh, but it's been a bit touch and go. Uh, she is currently hospitalized at uh, Children's Hospital in Milwaukee, hoping as things stabilize to be able to continue with the surgery that she needs. We hold them up in prayer as well. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray for ourselves and all people who worship you and your Son this holy night. By your holy word, lead us to say with the angels, We pray for your blessing upon the people of our city, our state, our nation, and our world. We pray for the poor and helpless, the cold and hungry, the sick and sad, that you would give them the joy of your salvation and the comfort of your presence. We pray for unbelievers and enemies of the church that through your law and gospel you would lead them to recognize your Son as their only hope for eternal life. Finally, we remember before you all those who rejoice with us in heaven, who died in faith and live in greater light than we. We confess that we are united with them and with one another. And, dear Lord, we ask your blessing on Shane Becker, nephew of our members Don and Bonnie, as he undergoes treatment for cancer. Be with him as he receives chemotherapy, granting him now and always joy because hope has arrived, hope both for this life and the one to come. May we all stay focused on our newborn king as we face life's challenges. And in that prayer, we remember also Alexa and Tim Steinbach and their daughter Elsie. Continue to be with this little child of your kingdom. Grant Elsie and her parents a faith that looks to another baby, the one born in Bethlehem to be our Savior. Grant Elsie strength and progress. May she grow each day stronger in body and stronger in you. We humbly offer up these prayers and praises in the words that Christ himself taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not to temptation but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And receive the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated for our closing hymn, Silent Night.
Good evening once again. And once again, a very Merry Christmas, a very blessed Christmas to you all. Uh, that, uh, certainly the wishes from uh, uh, the ministry team and the faculty and staff here at St. John's. Uh, Merry Christmas once again. God's blessings to all of you. May we always rejoice for hope has arrived. God bless. I think we'd all agree that this past year has been unlike any we've ever experienced. The events of 2020 touched all of us, our churches and schools, our work, our families. We've been frustrated, confused, impatient, inconvenienced, and maybe even a little afraid. It's a world that seems to have gone collectively crazy. There's been a lot of talk about how the problem of COVID will finally be overcome. There have been efforts to slow the spread of the disease, to find treatments, and to develop vaccines. But as big as this problem has been for us, for our country, and for the world, it pales in significance to an even greater problem, one that affects all of us, and one whose consequences are much more destructive. That's the problem of sin. How thankful we can be that the cure for that problem is not a matter of hope so's and speculation. In a few weeks, we'll be gathering at the manger of our newborn Savior, and there with believing and joyful hearts, we'll once again be reminded of the one who came to bring us the sure and lasting cure for our greatest affliction. The one who became one of us to take our sin and guilt on himself and to provide for us an eternal remedy for a condition that would have been terminal, eternally terminal for us all. This Christmas, we'll sing songs expressing our joy. We'll greet each other this season in a way that shows that joy and our love for each other. And we'll gather in worship and in our homes to express our thanks to the one who gave us the very kind of healing that we need. May you and your family, no matter what the outward circumstances may be, know the joy of the gift of a Savior that nothing can take away from you.